Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this uh, webinar on ISIC 27701, the new Privacy International Standard. We'll wait for a minute while people uh, log in, and then we'll begin the uh, the session. Okay, good afternoon everybody. My name is Alan Shipman and we'll be talking during this webinar about the new international standard uh, on privacy management. Uh, uh, please note that uh, all the attendees are muted. I can't hear anybody from that. If you have any questions, please enter them into the questions box and we will run through those any questions asked at the end uh, of the session okay so let us start and to introduce myself And for some reason, my computer's decided not to, as we go. So, introduce myself. I've been involved with personal information and the uh, UK Data Protection Act since the first uh, act, the 1984 Act, uh, previously as a data processor. Uh, I have the pleasure of chairing the British Standard Committee on Identity Management and Privacy Technologies, which I've done for about five years, and that mirrors the international ISO IEC committee with the same name. Uh, I also had the pleasure of sharing the work uh, on this new international standard and acted as editor uh, for that project. Um, and I'm in the process of writing a pocket guide that IT governance will publish, uh, I believe, early next year. Further information about that later on in the session. So what is the agenda for today? We'll start off with an introduction to the standard. We will have a look at some of the benefits of implementing the standard. We'll talk about how to extend your security management system to incorporate the requirements of the new standard. We'll talk about a few considerations that you may wish to take into account when doing that piece of work. And then at the very end, we will have a uh, discussion uh, on the certification processes. More about certification later. So that is the agenda for the session. 
uh, which I understand is due to last about 45 minutes uh, plus time for, for responding to questions at the end. And so what is this new uh, publication from ISO, uh, which ISO have given the number, uh, ISO IEC 27701, published in August this year. So it's been developed to add on to, to extend, uh, the information security standard, which is very widely recognized. Many people have uh, used it, many people implement it, many people are accredited to it. So it is simply an extension to that existing international standard. We all know that security is one of the elements that we need to deal with as part of managing uh, our privacy information. And we didn't want to reinvent the wheel, so we simply took that standard and have written another standard that goes on top of it. Uh, unlike 27001, which is just a requirements document, and of course, there's 27002, which is the equivalent guidance document. We took the decision to combine both requirements and guidance into the one document. And so we've ended up defining a privacy information management system, or PIMS for short. And so, yes. The new standard is based on the requirements and the control objectives and controls in 27001. It looks uh, in terms of layout just like 27001 and 27002, and it uses the same idea of requirements, controls, control objectives, and of course now uh, includes guidance. So people that are familiar with 27001 should find it very easy to understand what's required for 27701. It was developed by uh, the ISO committee that you see the uh, number four on the screen. That committee has 49 national bodies registered uh, to that committee, most of which have actually uh, put comments in at various stages during the process. There were, or there are, 29 observer members. Uh, these are countries that monitor what we're doing, don't necessarily comment on it. And there are 25 other bodies and these are not necessarily standard writing bodies that have the ability to put comments in to the uh, development of the, the, the product. And you'll notice the EDPB there as one of the external liaison bodies. They, in fact, were very active in the uh, work we were doing. They put uh, many, many comments in. Uh, and of course, we have taken all of those comments on board and dealt with them, um, uh, hopefully, accordingly. We know the EDPB do support the work that we've been doing here. So that's what the standard is. And yes, the new uh, acronym, if you like, PIMS, is what we now talk about this standard for. And it's designed for organizations to help them manage information about individuals that they have on their systems, they process uh, such that, for example, they can easily respond to requests from those individuals. They can use 
that information in the right sort of way and most importantly they protect the rights of those individuals. We all know that uh, laws change around the world, there are different, uh, different laws around. Uh, we will talk in a little while about how we deal with all of those. But here is a standard for organisations to, um, uh, to use to help them manage the personal information that they process. So that is that slide. Why on earth uh, did we go about doing this? And here are a few uh, numbers for those people interested in, in numbers. And you'll see the source of, um, uh, of these figures on the screen. Here you can see that uh, nearly half of organizations are aware of at least one compromise uh, for their systems. The study has suggested that a typical, a typical data breach will cost an organization around three million pounds to recover from. That's uh, a lot of money and so doing things to try and reduce the uh, possibility of data breaches uh, is quite high on a number of organizations agendas and of course we're not just talking about large businesses small businesses have breaches small businesses get fined for doing things wrong and the standard is designed just as 27,001 is designed to work for both large and small businesses. So the small business approach. Yes, we believe the most common cause of a breach is a malicious attack. And this is where all the security features come in. Uh, have organizations got the most appropriate uh, security measures to try and deflect all these various attacks that, that are coming in. They're happening all the time and companies report multiple uh, attacks per day. A lot of organizations do that. Yes, we're all I'm sure familiar with phishing and the stats tell us that about a third of all breaches involve outsiders um, using phishing techniques to uh, get what they're after. And of course, stolen credentials, password compromises, all of those various things. Uh, about you know, nearly a third of all breaches involve the use of um, stolen credentials. So what are all organizations doing to reduce the risk of that happening? And, and of course, one of the ways um, is to um, ensure that you have covered all the things that you could possibly cover uh, and you have uh, things in place to try and reduce uh, these, um, these breaches. So some numbers there. So there are a number of key definitions that we use within 27701. And these definitions, along with all of the other privacy related standards produced by SC27, use definitions from ISO 29100, which is our definitions standard. Um, we use the definitions from that standard uh, in 27701, but we know that many jurisdictions use different terms in the privacy space and use different definitions in the privacy space. So for example, in the standard, you will see the uh, thing which 
is called personally identifiable information or PAI as it is known. This we know is the term used in some countries, some jurisdictions, but we also know that the GDPR uses the phrase personal data. We've also seen the phrase personal information being used for the information that we are dealing with. And what the standard says is that the standard uses, for example, PII, but if you in your jurisdiction use a different term, then please go ahead and use that term and use your local definition when you're implementing the standard. You don't necessarily have to use PII. You don't necessarily have to use the definition that's in the standard. You use what is locally relevant. So this is one of the ways where we try to make this document truly international. We also use the phrase PII principle, which again we know is called data subject under the GDPR. And again, we have a definition that we use in the standard. But please use your own definition, uh, what is locally appropriate in your area. Similarly, the phrases PII controller and PAI processor. This is called within GDPR data controller and data processor. Again, please use the terms that you use locally and so it can apply in your local jurisdiction. And of course, for those of you that are involved with international organizations, you have to make a decision as to how you are going to reference these various key terms and what definitions you're going to use. And again, you may wish to use the same principle of saying, well, whatever is appropriate in that particular jurisdiction, that is what uh, you will use in that area. So moving along, why was the document developed? Obviously, in the early days, uh, there was quite a lot of pressure uh, to form some sort of way uh, of advising organizations what they actually need to do in order to manage their, their personal information. The laws, the GDPR in particular, do not tell you uh, how to do things. They just simply state what the law is. And without things like this, without other guidance, you have to go and actually read the legislation to find out what you need to do. Hopefully, 2 7701 will take you through uh, many of the things, all the things that you uh, ought to do something about in order that you manage your personal information well, properly, and hopefully in accordance with the local local laws. As we say, privacy regulations don't provide much guidance. Where do you get that guidance? We know various organizations have produced guidance. Here in the ISO world, we produce standards that you can implement, that you can comply with as a way of being able to demonstrate that you're taking things seriously and you've done something about all the various things that you need to do. So we went ahead probably around four years ago, the project started to develop this new standard to produce further guidance to produce further controls, uh, et cetera, et cetera. 
which is what has now been been published. There are quite a number of annexes to the document, uh, and these include mappings to various other standards that have been produced. Uh, for those of you that uh, like standards, I've already mentioned 29100, uh, published a few years ago, 29151, which is a code of practice for protecting PII. Uh, there is a mapping between this new document and that document. And uh, two or three years ago, I also published 27018, which is specifically for public cloud providers. This was produced uh, on the requirement of those public cloud providers as some way that they could demonstrate that they were doing things to help their PI controllers, their data controllers, to do what they need to do. So that's a specific standard for public cloud providers, and we've seen a number of uh, cloud providers being certified to that particular standard. We also have a mapping in our standard to the GDPR, so you can cross-reference a particular section in the PIM standard with the relevant uh, GDPR uh, requirements, uh, both, again, for controllers and for processors. And just to give one example of that, there's a requirement for data controllers uh, to meet that data subject rights under the GDPR. In the PIMS document, we have a number of control controls covering those obligations. What is the organization's obligations to those PI principles? And of course, for each control that we produce, we uh, also include some guidance to help people understand uh, what the control is all about and what it means. So, carrying on with the webinar, what are the benefits, the next stage of the agenda, what are the benefits of implementing a privacy information management system? And again, what, uh, what it can't do is prove that an organization complies with the law. That is not the scope of a standard. But what it can do is support that demonstration that you are doing your very best, based again, as we will see in a minute, on a risk assessment that you are support, supporting compliance with the relevant laws, the relevant regulations, and where appropriate, the relevant contracts that you will have with various other organizations. We hope it will focus you on looking at how you manage personal information, what all your systems and processes do, and gives guidance on uh, a good structure for that and hopefully help you think about how you're doing it and improve your structure and focus uh, on that process. We hope it will help you demonstrate uh, to senior management within an organization how you really do need these days a good culture uh, within the organization for managing personal information. It's important, actually, that everybody within the organization supports what the organization is trying to do um, and a cultural way of uh, 
dealing with that is an appropriate way of doing it. And as I mentioned earlier, a risk-based risk approach uh, is the way to, uh, to deal with that. We know to get a, a good security management system, that is always based uh, on a risk-based approach. Now we are extending that to a risk-based approach for privacy management. We hope it will uh, encourage you to think about continually improving uh, the way you do things, looking at things that go wrong and trying to find good ways of uh, stopping that happening again. Uh, and that, again, I know is one of the principles from the Information Commissioner's Office. Things do go wrong, but what do organisations do to improve their systems to try and reduce the risk of it happening uh, again. And of course, if an organization already has a culture of complying with um, things, international standards such as the information security standard, then it integrates directly with that to, um, to, to help the organization benefit from its introduction. So some ideas of some of the benefits uh, of doing this. I've had a number of questions over the development of this uh, that says, yeah, but in the UK, we already have a British standard that does this. And some of you may be familiar with BS 10012, which was first published in uh, 2009. So are they the same? Are they different? Why have we got both there? Well, yep, 27701 is an international standard, and it talks about a privacy information management system. BS 10012 is a British standard, and it talks about a personal information management system. Both actually end up with a PIMS, and in truth, they are actually the same thing. And uh, I do have a mapping of all of the uh, sections in 10,012 to the sections in 27701. And they actually map very well together. So the British standard is in a UK context. The international standard is in a worldwide standard. The international standard is not standalone. It requires the information security standard to be implemented. The British standard is a standalone. And you can do everything in 10,012 without necessarily implementing 27001. Mm. And of course, being a British standard, we republished BS 10,012 uh, a year or so ago, um, such that it aligned directly with the GDPR and the Data Protection Act. The international standard doesn't necessarily align directly to any particular uh, data protection law. Uh, it hopes to align or to be able to be aligned with any uh, data protection uh, regulation, uh, and hence it will apply in the wider area. So I guess what would be my recommendation if you're a UK company uh, just dealing in the UK, then the British standard is fine. If you already have 27001 certification, then probably go for the international standard. Uh, if obviously if you're working internationally, then the international standard um, is the way to go. So hopefully that's uh, 
shows you the difference between the two different standards. There's a Cisco data privacy uh, benchmark study uh, for which uh, it is available on the web. Uh, and this actually reports that 59% of organizations believe they comply with the GDPR or with most of the GDPR. I note that the people asked were security experts that were familiar uh, with privacy. I, I wonder what percentage you would get if you asked privacy experts who maybe have some familiarity with security. Uh, I guess you may get a, a slightly different figure there. But uh, if you added the 59% and the 29%, that's the number of organizations that believe they will be able to demonstrate compliance uh, with the law, which of course all companies actually need to be able to demonstrate. Uh, if you like, it's worrying that the percentage is that low. What are the advantages? What the people who uh, can demonstrate uh, what they are doing? Well, they believe that the cost of a breach is lower. They're less likely to have a breach. Any breaches will affect uh, less records. And customers, your customers, will have less uh, concern over what you're doing uh, with their personal uh, information. And actually, with good security systems, uh, system downtime uh, can be less. So some thoughts uh, from the uh, uh, the Cisco study. What we hope as a standards body is that this will be the industry standard uh, as the adopted approach for managing personal information uh, throughout the world. We understand that the take-up uh, is very good uh, on the standard, and many people are now looking at it to see, is this something we, um, uh, we really ought to be doing? I'll talk a little bit later uh, about certification and where we are with that. So privacy laws, yes, there's a GDPR. Yes, there's a UK Data Protection Act. Uh, yes, there is the Californian, New Californian Act, which we understand will go live early next year. Um, the new international standard addresses all of those, um, those regulations. So what are the benefits um, <coughs> excuse me. What things does it hopefully do? Well, it hopes it will build the trust element, both with your uh, yourselves internally and with your customers. <coughs> we believe it will simplify what you are doing uh, by giving you guidance as to uh, what things you need to be doing. <coughs> We hope it will reduce complexity within the organization of how they manage or go about managing compliance. We hope those organizations that have privacy audits, those audits will go quicker, uh, less expensive, I guess, because organizations know and can demonstrate what they're doing. It will hope that uh, the, all the organization stakeholders will be much uh, much more assured about what the organization is doing because they're following uh, industry good practice. It will demonstrate that actually you are taking things seriously in this area, in the area of privacy and information security. And hopefully uh, when certification etc. comes around, there will be a formal way of organizations to gain international recognition 
as a way um, uh, of demonstrating they manage personal information well. And hopefully this will end up as the industry benchmark for managing personal information. So what have we got in 27701? Yes, it's very similar to the information security management system, but it is different. And what do we need to do? We recognize that information security is a key aspect, but we then need to extend that to add on uh, all of the uh, privacy requirements. Uh, and we're all familiar with the CIA principle. Uh, these also relate to, um, to personal information, of course. And so what we do is we define within the new standard the additional requirements, the additional controls, the additional guidance to extend the ISMS and end up with a PIMS. Yep, and the additional roles, we end up calling it a privacy information management system. So 27701, the main content is in four clauses, uh, and these set out these additional requirements. We say that every clause in 27001 is relevant. We don't say all that security control you don't need to do. You need to do all of those plus some more content. And so the majority of what is in 27,001 is unchanged. And what we ask people to do when they're talking about information security, now talk about information security and privacy management. That, if you like, is the new phrase for it. Mentioned earlier about risk assessments, one of the big differences here when you're talking about risk assessment for privacy information, it's not only a risk to the business, but it's also a risk to the individuals concerned. And organizations need to take into account risks to the individuals concerned. Section five extends what's in 27,001 and it uh, doesn't change, but adds to uh, a number of the controls uh, in, um, in the security standard. And just to give you an example, and I just mentioned uh, risk assessment, the extension talks about requiring a privacy impact assessment, which takes into account both the risk to the organization as well as the risks to the individual concerned. So there's an example of an extension to an existing, the existing risk assessment for security to turn it into a risk assessment for security and privacy. Section six extends the guidance in 27,002 uh, to take into account those uh, additional uh, additional guidance and again to give you an example of that uh, one of the sections in um, 27002 talks about the disposal of media that is no longer required there's an addition in the PIM standard to make sure that if there is any personal information stored on that media please make sure it's not accessible once you've disposed of the media. And we've seen many examples over the years of people disposing of things inappropriately and personal information being compromised in along those routes. So that's five and six. Section seven is a new set of controls for data controllers. And this addresses 
uh, four different areas that controllers need to take into account that are not in the security standard. Here we're talking about conditions for collection and processing, your obligations to the principles, privacy by design, whoops, privacy by design and privacy by default. That was a horrible phrase to say. Uh, and if you're sharing, transferring uh, personal information, what controls you need in place to make sure that's done within the legislation in your area. And you can imagine a very similar set uh, of uh, sections for processors. Here, of course, the controller is mainly um, um, the one that gets, gets it if things go wrong. But again, the processors need to make sure they are doing what the controllers of the information require them to do. And we have exactly the same four headings there. So this is simply a summary slide which talks about what we've just, um, just talked about, the four sections that extends the ISMS to end up uh, as a PIMS. Things worth thinking about when you are implementing the new standard, you need to involve both security experts and privacy experts. You need to ensure that the scope of the PIMS, which may not be the same as the scope of, of, of the ISMS, it can be uh, just part of the scope uh, of the ISMS, but make sure it's appropriate to what you want to do. Make sure you understand what you've got, what personal information you've got, what you're using it for, and know how long you're actually going to retain it and how you're going to get rid of it at the end of that retention period. The final section is on certification. And as you can imagine, with a new international standard, uh, this is now the area that is being considered by the various committees. There is a whole process that needs to be gone through to get to a formally accredited certification. That is not available at this point in time. So you can receive an accredited certification for the information security standard, but not currently for the privacy standard. And obviously, there are a number of people, including all of the accreditation bodies around the world, uh, are now looking at this and seeing what can be done. There, there may well end up being a new international standard on what auditors need to do in order to uh, achieve an accredited certification. There is an article within the GDPR which addresses certification, Article 42. And here, Article 42 is encouraging uh, schemes that can demonstrate compliance with the regulation. We believe this to be an appropriate scheme one of the challenges we have is that there are two different types of certification, one for management systems and one for products and services. We have gone down the management system route because we believe that is the appropriate way for organizations to manage the personal data that they process. However, the GDPR talks about certification to the product and services uh, process. Obviously, we're now in discussion with them about how we can deal with that situation. Finally, uh, IT governance are um, providing a gap analysis tool for 
the new PIM standard. Uh, that there, there is um, further information available on that uh, on their website and on this screen here various things that IT governance are doing including uh, the book that I talked about that I'm writing along with Steve Watkins who wrote the security book and um, various other consultancy and certification things being um, offered by IT governance. There is the final slide with further contact details on there. So I hope that gave you what you need. I will now have a look um, at some of the questions and I see there are a few questions have been put in. Uh, if I don't get through all of these questions, we will uh, send answers round to the various people uh, after this session. So the first question, does it cover the full GDPR requirements? I believe the answer to be yes to that because there is a mapping which demonstrates uh, that is true. So the answer to that one is yet, yes. Uh, does the new standard cover some of the requirements of the GDPR? There's the second question. We believe it covers all of the requirements of the GDPR. Uh, there's a request for the slides, which I believe uh, will be uh, made available to all of you. Um, there's a question if we already have a robust ISMS in place, including privacy policy, uh, data protection policy and GDPR statement. Are we already well placed to get the additional accreditation? Well, the additional certification, yes, you are uh, well on the way, but please re, um, read the new document to make sure you've actually covered all of the areas that you need to cover. It's not just about policies, it's about implementing those, etc., etc. Is it possible to have a mapping? Um, I uh, will have a look and see whether I can make that available. I'm trying to remember. I don't believe it is currently published, but certainly very happy to have a look at that. Uh, the next question, if uh, the new standard is not standalone. How do you implement a standalone PIM system? Well, I'm sorry, one of the requirements of PIMS is to implement uh, uh, good security, and that is being done through 27001 implementation. You cannot do 27701 without doing 27001. However, if you happen to be within the UK only, then I would recommend you look at the British Standard 10,012, uh, which is a standalone document. So that is that question. Uh, next question, do you think that the uh, 27,001, which is currently the 2013 version, will be updated in the coming years? The answer to that question is yes, it is currently being updated. Work is going, it is being undertaken to provide that update. I'm involved on some of those committees that is doing part of that work. So I know that is happening. Uh, I believe the projection is 2021 for uh, publishing that, but please don't hold me to that particular date. Uh, 
and of course yes we'll then have to update 27701 to match the new 27001 next question is we're currently accredited to the uh, information security standard in the next uh, audit should we ask for the PIM standard to be scoped I would recommend you talk to your certification body well ahead of time to say uh, you, you want to do this what is your certification body doing in terms of them getting ready to do certifications to the new PIMS standard remember certification bodies can issue certification certificates the only difference is it's not an accredited process therefore potentially different certification bodies could operate in different ways the advantage of accreditation is that all certification bodies around the world work along the same processes that is the objective of the accreditation process uh, next question did the ANISA addressed also the link between cyber security and GDPR uh, sorry I'm not necessarily familiar with the work that ENISA does uh, I know there are quite close links between ENISA and ISO so I guess I would say I hope that they would but I can't answer specifically next question clients will want to know this is worthwhile and we'll ask typically how much time and effort this will take any rough ideas um, I was speaking to a um, uh, somebody I know in a certification body who has just uh, actually issued uh, their first certification certificates and their comment um, was that oh it took them much longer to do than the security um, certification a lot of that of course is that this is new they have not done it before so they are um, understanding new areas the, the current uh, security certification um, auditors may not be familiar enough with privacy legislation to audit organizations properly so what I'm currently hearing is that it's taking them longer because it's a bigger scope potentially uh, there are now laws there's no specific law that says you have to be secure but there are specific laws that say you have to manage personal information properly next question mentioned a gap analysis between the BS and the ISO is this available that's a question we've already had I will see what I can do on that one uh, next question has anyone qualified the amount of effort to implement the PIMS uh, no and I would say it really um, uh, depends upon how well the organization is doing things now yeah in theory if you are complying with and can demonstrate you're complying with the local law you should be doing everything already uh, this may throw up easier better ways of doing things but it's really dependent upon where the organization is now the next question what does a small business which trades internationally but does not have um, the security standard should it stick to the British standard I would say implementing the British standard is a good starting point uh, for, for those sorts of organizations interestingly one of the discussions I had um, with, with the auditor who's auditing some of these 
what they are looking at and saying in terms of effort to implement the PIMS, it's not necessarily the size of the organization that is relevant. It's actually how much in personal information have you got and how sensitive is it? A very small organization could have a very large database of very sensitive personal information. And there, that's probably um, a, a bigger uh, requirement to implement the PIM standard. And it may take them longer uh, than a very large organization that holds very, uh, very little personal information. So the next question is talking about um, the uh, 27,001 and the 27,018 setup. If you have all read that already in place, uh, does it make sense to have the, the new set of controls? I would say if you are uh, providing a public cloud service, and the scope of your um, certification to 27,018 is just limited to that service. You probably have sufficient. There are discussions going on within the standards groups as to what we should now do with 27,018. Uh, it does map across. Uh, should we keep the two and make sure they stay in sync or uh, actually do we still need 27018 and we'll be taking views from the implementers of 27018 as to where we go there. Uh, we're almost at four o'clock. I'm not sure exactly how many more questions uh, we have. Um, so I'll do another one or two. Is there any estimate, estimation regarding the certification scheme? Um, no, it, we're in the hands of various other bodies. It's not um, a responsibility of the standards body to organize certification. So it's really down to the certification authorities um, and bodies like in the UK, the United Kingdom Accreditation Service. Uh, I would like organizations to be asking UCAS, when are they going to be able to get an accredited certification for this? Because it will be uh, potential customers pressure that gets that that done. So if you are 27,001 certified and it is to be changed, um, yes, we will need to change 27701. Will that put many people off implementing? No, there will be a relatively straightforward route. As there is with the security standard, there is always a route from one version to the next. There is always a, a time period, usually three years, for organizations to, um, uh, to move on. And typically, uh, you don't have to change in a major way uh, anything you actually do. OK, I think I've reached my time limit. I don't think I can go any further with responding to questions. I'll have a look at all the unanswered questions and um, respond to those uh, in due course. So thank you very much for all of the people that attended. I see we have 102 people that stuck out the whole time. So congratulations to you people, and thank you all very much for attending. Thank you very much indeed.